All right, welcome back. This is day number 16 on our 30 days of raw vegan foods on Your Health, Your Way. And uh, yesterday we talked about the challenges of living in a raw vegan experience. Um, today we'll be talking, I'll be talking with Lisa about uh, one of our big obstacles, grains. Um, but Lisa, let's check in and see how our day is going first. Well, if you joined us over the weekend, um, I had mentioned that I was going to take the 30% of cooked foods that I was eating in, during the week, like from seven days, and consolidate that into just the weekend because it was really hard to calculate, you know, how much raw food I was actually having, and it was just so easy to give in to temptation every day, have a little bit of something that I don't know if I was going above the 30 or not. I mean, it, it's still an approximation. So um, I'm going to do all raw Monday through Friday. And today I started out with a smoothie uh, for a snack. I had some nuts for lunch. I had a nice big salad. Then I went to work out at the gym and I came home and I had my great uh, banana date cinnamon uh, coconut milk, coconut water smoothie, which I call life in a bottle. And how are you holding up? That sounds good. It was excellent. <laughs> <laughs> um, I started my day as I normally do with a smoothie and um, had a mid-morning snack of an orange and lunch, another smoothie, came home, had a three ounce bag of nuts and a handful of dates, um, and then did some exercise and finished my day off with uh, a big salad. Um, Sounds good. Now, one of the things that I noticed today was I had a lot of gas and bloating, yeah. and I'm attributing that to the likely uh, chance that I had too much raw vegan gourmet snacks over the weekend. Um, and those tend to contain a lot of nuts, um, and that'll, you know, kind of be rough on the digestive system. I didn't feel like I was overdoing the raw vegan gourmet snacks, but my body seems to be telling me different. So um, now I know I probably should have avoided the uh, three ounces of pistachios um, this afternoon, but at least I did it with awareness. So. Yes, and it helped you stay raw. And it it's helped, helped me to stay raw. raw, right. So, so that um, that's pretty much been my day so far or well it's toward the end of the day now yeah, so um, let's talk about grains all right well the topic is grains um, the United States you might be familiar with the USDA the United States Department of Agriculture they have put out the food pyramid which tells us how much of each different uh, food group we should consume per day historically speaking grains have constituted the majority of that pyramid and that leads us to believe that grains are great for us, you know, for the fiber and so on. But I know that there's more to the story than that, isn't there? There is, um, and there's absolutely uh, a relationship between agricultural lobbyists and Congress. And uh, grain manufacturers, especially those that, uh, that sell genetically modified grains, um, they influence regulatory agencies like the USDA. Um, through their lobbying efforts with Congress. And the USDA uh, is the organization that uh, creates the guidelines and the regulations for the agriculture industry, which of course brings us the food. So um, agriculture lobbies then effectively are creating the guidelines and regulations for the, FD, uh, the USDA, excuse me, um, for their own industry. Uh, and they do that through regulatory capture. Regulatory capture is when uh, a regulatory government agency like the USDA or the FDA or the EPA um, ends up promoting the interest of uh, the industries that they are supposed to be creating guidelines for and regulating. So um, it ends up kind of backwards and it usually happens because uh, these regulatory agencies are in the back pockets or somehow controlled by the special interest groups that represent the industry. So, um, now we're not talking about the family farm here. We're talking about uh, agribusiness lobbies that represent companies like Kraft and Monsanto and Philip Morris. And companies like this are pushing you know, upwards of $150 million a year uh, into campaign funding and into pushing legislation through Congress that allows them to hold up or to amend bills that address things like climate change or that regulate pollution or uh, biofuel production and food labeling. So um, 
uh, what else did I want to say did about that? My plate, I think. Yeah. So, so, yeah, we were talking about the uh, the, uh, the food pyramid, and the USD. They also influence through those same channels uh, USDA's um, choose my plate, which is what used to be the well-known uh, food pyramid. pyramid. Now, lobbying influences all facets of government, and producers of agriculture besides grains have their influence too. So why does grain get so much attention from the USDA? Well, good question. So um, the top major crops in the United States are corn, and when corn is uh, harvested in its, in its dried state, it is classified as a grain, um, soy, uh, soybeans, hay, wheat, a grain, uh, cotton, uh, sorghum, a grain, rice, a grain. So you see where I'm going here. Um, corn grown for grain actually accounts to almost a quarter of all the corn that's harvested in, in the United States. Um, most of the rest of the stuff is used for silage to feed uh, livestock. Um, and then there's, of course, that that's used for uh, making high fructose corn syrup and things like that. And then there's uh, things that are used, uh, there's corn used for household uh, things like drywall and paint and dyes and crayons and shoe polish and uh, even things like uh, uh, antibiotics, yeah. um, are, adhesives, are adhesives things like that. So, um, but you can see the point is that grain products make up the largest portion of agribusiness in this country sure. and uh, even mega farms that um, that produce meat products um, have their own grain operations that they use to feed their livestock and uh, whatever grain they aren't using to feed their livestock then finds its way into the grain market so grain is a big thing in agriculture and the grain industry, um, they want to have a say-so over uh, the regulations and things like what goes on to our food labels and stuff like that. So again, through regulatory capture, they are um, really leaning heavily on organizations like the USDA and the FDA, who regulates the food labels, um, to uh, kind of get what they want. Uh, out of those regulatory agencies. It's so fascinating to see the tie-in. It is, yeah. And, and so, yeah, so I mean... Follow the money trail, as they say, right? Ex absolutely. And, and grain is what brings in the big money for, for agribusiness. And uh, government regulatory agencies are so heavily influenced um, by the agricultural lobbies um, that, you know, they, they end up promoting the interests of you know, in the end, if, as far as agriculture goes, grain. Oh, so the question then uh, remains whether or not grain is good for us. Well, from from a historical perspective, maybe in the past grains were not harmful to us. They may have been good for us, but in recent times, like you mentioned, there's a lot of genetic engineering going on. Mm -hmm. In any case, grains are actually very hard to digest and they're fattening. You've probably seen uh, the uh, livestock, uh, what do you call it, the, the farmers that, that have their, they're raising their livestock to sell for market, right. they want to fatten them up as quickly as possible. Grain is really cheap and animals get fat. Well, it's the same thing it does to us. Um, a great documentary is called King Corn that you can watch. It's about the corn industry. Very good. And one. a great book that has to do with grain specifically is called Grain Dead by Douglas Graham. Mm -hmm. So, um, so if you're talking about a raw vegan diet, then uh, we probably want to avoid grains, even though they're not an animal product or an animal byproduct, right? Right. And I'd like to mention, just for the for this discussion here, beans and grains together, because there's a lot of similarities between the two. Beans and grains are both acid forming. They also both have enzyme inhibitors, which means that it does not allow our bodies to digest it easily. Digesting beans and grains is a lot of hard work for our body, so it depletes our energy uh, since it's tied up in the digestive process and it tires us. Unlike fruits and vegetables that give us the fiber that the grain and the beans are supposed to give us, and they're also very hydrating because of the, the high water content. And another problem with grains, and you see this uh, more recently, you hear about this more recently, is that grains are tied in with allergies, 
and digestive disorders like colitis, diverticulitis, ir irritable, bowel <laughs> irritable bowel syndrome or IBS, <laughs> and gas and bloating. And that makes sense because grains are hard to digest. So all of those would make sense that, that they happen. Now, grains are also very tempting, the breads and the crackers and so on. Um, so the best thing to do is to avoid them. But if you're going to eat them, eat them in, in small amounts. Make sure that your raw fruits, raw vegetables comprise the majority of your, of your diet. Um, eat them in the wintertime because in the summertime, remember we said they're, they're acidic. So in the summertime, our bodies are more acidic because of the heat. Mm -hmm. So have most of your grains in the wintertime to help balance out that acid alkaline balance. Also have them sprouted. Sprouting them helps to release the enzyme inhibitors, which makes the digestion a little bit easier on you. And finally, remember that grains are a starch, beans are a protein. So a lot of people will combine starch and protein in the same meal, which only causes fermentation, gas, and bloating because that protein is sitting there in the gut mixed with the starch, and the protein takes a lot longer to digest than the starch. Oh, and that brings me to one more thing. For our pets, a lot of times pets have grain or grain and dairy allergies. And you'll bring your dog, for example, to the vet with a skin allergy, uh, with behavioral issues with um, uh, leaking, like urine leaking, incontinence, uh, overweightness, and numerous other illnesses. And a lot of times that has to do because they're eating grain, uh, food that has grain in it. So go to the, the health food store that for pets or get healthier choices, do your research, and get grain-free and dairy-free dog food so that you can treat your furry babies as better than you can treat yourself. <laughs> we do. Well said. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so the grain industry then uh, has become really embedded with GMOs, so it's not really a healthy option to begin with. But even if you're talking about uh, non-genetically modified grains, um, grains don't fit well into a raw vegan lifestyle because they're simply difficult to digest. Right. So. Right. You want ease. So. Right, yeah, definitely. So um, this is your Healthier Way. Thank you for watching. And in our next video, we're going to talk about soy. Soy, along with similar lines. Take care. Hi, I'm Lisa. Welcome to Your Health My Way. Today we'll be discussing the skeletal system of the Guatemalan worm and its counterpart, the Tahitian walnut beetle.